Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Deborah here. Four years ago, we had an emergency episode, which we held in a live venue the day after it was announced that Trump would be president of the United States of America. It's been a really, really tough four years, especially for our American listeners. So we just want to send an enormous love, celebration and solidarity to everybody in the United States of America but also to everyone because uh, the president isn't called the leader of the free world for nothing. America left the Paris Climate Agreement the day after the election. And uh, as one of our recent guests told us, four more years of Trump uh, would have meant the end of the world for the environment. But as it is, the Biden-Harris administration have promised to have America back in in January. Trump also uh, pulled out of the World Health Organization. Of course, there was a notice period, so that will never happen. Uh, but that in a pandemic affects the whole world in such a dramatic way. Uh, so we are all extraordinarily grateful that this has happened. Um, more than that, America is a cultural and political thermometer for the world. And it's a really big, big deal that this nightmare is over, but now the work must begin. So we at The Guilty Feminist are committed to doing that work globally with our listeners. We hope you'll join us. Uh, but first, I think it's okay to take a few days uh, to celebrate this and to celebrate that both the first person of colour and the first woman is on a winning ticket. Uh, this is amazing and representation really, really does matter. And we've seen and heard that from a lot of our listeners over the last few days. So we look forward to exploring lots of issues. Uh, I've already had messages from both Choose Love and Amnesty International saying we need to immediately start the work to make sure that the Biden-Harris administration does what it says it wants to do and is going to do. Uh, so we're not going to get complacent, but I think this week we really are allowed to be happy. Thank you to everyone in America and around the world uh, who did the work to make this happen. And I'm a feminist, but Kamala Harris's outfit when she gave that speech was lickable. And now the podcast. I'm a feminist, but the other day I had professional hair and makeup done by a highly masked visored uh, makeup artist because I was doing television. And a lot of television, as you know, now is done at home in front of your bookcase via Zoom. And I wanted to look my best because it was a really big deal show. And when I got on the Zoom, the man and woman I was talking to, they were very sort of, you know, just jeans and t-shirt. And they said, wow, you look amazing. You look so glamorous. And I said, yeah, well, I'm camera ready. And they went, did you think the TV show was today? This is just a prep call. And I didn't have the forethought to go, oh, yeah, but I'm doing another TV thing later. So I thought, you know, get it all done. Like, I I just went, oh, oh, and they laughed. But afterwards, I said to someone, and this is the I'm a feminist butt part, I smashed that call. I seemed so smart because I looked so good. I could see myself on the Zoom and I looked like a million dollars. And I was just coming out with all of this stuff and connecting ideas. And it was because I was living up to my lipstick and my eyeliner. I mean, it's hard to, I mean, listen, it's 10 a.m. I don't have anything on. I don't have tinted moisturizer on. I've barely brushed my hair. So no one can imagine how smart I was. Honestly, I was just living up to it. And I realized afterwards, I said, I said to someone, well, I was smart because I looked that good. But sometimes it works. Sometimes it lifts your confidence. <laughs> oh, yeah. 100%, 100%. So even though I wasn't clever enough to know that I was on a prep call, not a television show, the lipstick and the eyeliner and the flawless it appearance a, of my skin. smash the prep. I am a feminist, but the other day I was on a Zoom call. It was for work and one of them, I know her moderately, and I was looking at the Zoom and I thought, I need to write to her and say, you can fix the video so you look as good as you can. You can do that HD thing on the video for Zoom. Oh, yeah. And I thought she's important and senior, but she could look better. Her skin wow. could look better. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Sindhu, I was very excited to find out that was a function. And then I yeah. found out I already had it turned on. And I yes. was like, wow, <laughs> yes. this is me looking good. That's but disappointing. I know that isn't she it? didn't. And I thought, you know, it's not very feminist of me, but I'm a feminist. But yeah, she could have looked better. No, fair enough. Uh, I'm a feminist, but I enjoy and often employ the turn of phrase husbanding resources. <laughs> That's a great phrase. 
I'm a feminist, but uh, my youngest daughter has an interview for her next school. And I do believe that young girls especially should be allowed to speak about what they care about, you know, not put them in boxes. That And so when she started telling me that she wanted to talk about something that I didn't think sounded very serious, I did step in and say to her, no one is going to care about that. You need to talk about science. <laughs> I don't care wow. what your interests are. You need to talk about science. And she wow. said, but mom, and I said, no. You want to be taken seriously, you better talk about science. I want you wow. to get into the school. Sorry, it's the truth. Deb, you don't have me on this show to lie. <laughs> I, I, if I wanted someone who could self-censor, I would never book you. Clearly, exactly. I don't want that. Clearly. So, And in case anyone cares, my elder daughter had a stern word with me after. She was like, let her talk about puppets. No, let her talk about... Just let her be because, you know, girls... And I was like, shush, go away and be 16. What did she else. want to talk about? TikTok. Uh, no, 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 no. She's not allowed on TikTok. She wanted to talk about some books that she'd been reading about some graveyard, something like I was already bored. And I was like, this is candy fluff. No, talk about science. <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll have this. We'll have this. I'm with your other daughter. We'll have this fight offline. I'm a feminist. But yesterday I said to two men, sorry, I might be a little overconfident because I've just done the Peloton Hamilton ride. <laughs> which I had and I was there riding my peloton going I'm not giving away my shot I'm not giving away yes. my shot and you know you get off that ride very sweaty very hyped up a lot of endorphins racing then you get on a call with two male work colleagues and you're straight in there bang they say something you go that isn't right you're just straight back like a champion debater. And I realized I'm like, I'm being a lot. And I was like, guys, I'm sorry, I'm overconfident. I've just done the Hamilton Peloton ride. I, I, I could take anybody in a fight. They laughed because they are from a musical theater tradition. So I'm a feminist, but the other day we went for dinner, my husband and I, and the bill came, but he went to the washroom and I could have paid the bill. I could have, because I had my card with me. But I thought, you know what? I won't. I'll wait for him <laughs> to pay the bill because I can because then he can and because really it's not related to my feminism so I just sat there with the bill and when he came back he said what well, did you settle it and I'm like no you're here and he said oh, okay and he settled it and I felt very good <laughs> Sindhu as ever a delight no but I paid for coffee the other day when we went to Unico it's not like he I don't pay. I just, is a lucky lucky man I just thought that day I thought you know why not let's just wait this one out you just wanted so to, did you want to sit there like Elizabeth Taylor I did. Waiting I, for Richard Burton. Yeah, no, no. And I was like drinking my cocktail and he came and the, the funny thing was that he said, did you settle it? And I was like, no, because, you know, like, why are you here? And he was like, oh, all right. And was what so is the bad. point of you otherwise? Right, what exactly, is the point hey? of you? From a variety of bedrooms and kitchens via Zoom, The Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Cindy V, and very special guests, Jamila Rivesby, Colleen Hickman, Van Riley, and Donatella Rivera, talking about lived experience. Woo! Yay! <laughs> yeah. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, with me is Cindy V, and we're talking about lived experience. Uh, today we're talking about lived experience, uh, Sindhu, because we have, in our posse slash audience, before we introduce them, we have the fantastic Jamila Rivesby, uh, we have Colleen Hickman, we have Val Riley, and we have Donatella Rivera and Starling. Can everyone just say hi? Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, so uh, Jamila has been on the show before. Regular listeners will know she's a fantastic journalist from Australia. Colleen and Val are going to talk to us about having lived through a pandemic before and what we can learn from them, which actually is the subject of Jamila's book, coincidentally. I don't know how it's happened. Definitely a uh, coincidence. It's a full coincidence. <laughs> Donatella is from Amnesty International, and uh, she's going to be talking to us about uh, some concerning things that are happening in care homes here, because we don't want people with lots of lived experience to not be looked after. And Starling's going to do music. So, hey, everybody. But in the meantime, it's me and Sindhu V. Sindhu V, my co-pilot, how have you been? I have been well. This is a early recording. Am I allowed to say that? It's 10 a.m. It is. Recording. Well, it's, we're, we're accommodating the Australians who which are... Which I think is great because... Great. Uh, We've got so many Aussies on the line, which we love. Which we love. But I'm good. You know, I'm acutely aware that 
something that started at the end of winter is now going into the beginning of winter. And the way that time works, that's pretty much a year is coming up for this pandemic oh, yeah. thing. I mean, it, it really brings a new meaning to singing happy birthday twice when you're washing your hands, when you're thinking that the <laughs> pandemic's almost a year old. Happy birthday, dear pandemic. <laughs> Why does it get two, two happy birthdays? That's what I don't understand. I think birthdays are pretty much ruined from here on in. Firstly, I'm never going to be able to watch anyone spit on their own cake while they blow out the candles and then cut it up and pass that spit around. Why did we ever do that? Secondly, the happy birthday song is triggering for me now. Oh. It, it, you know, like when I'm singing the song, then I see them blow out the cake. I'm doing this. I'm rubbing the hands. I'm rubbing the hands. I think we're going to have to come up with new birthday things. Firstly, someone's got to write a new birthday song. It's not unreasonable. One that doesn't evoke the worst year of our lives. Oh, we lost Deb. I think she was going to say someone's going to have to write a new birthday song. And I feel, can everyone still hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah, I can great. hear you. Yeah, I vote well, for Starling uh, writing the new birthday song. Yeah, I I'm think Starling, you should. I think Starling, you should. Um, yeah. But also in our house, we sing the Danish birthday song as well as the English one. And the Danish one is E-D-E-L, whoever's Fussil's Day, Hua, Hua, Hua. And that is not triggering from a pandemic point of view because the Danes never came up with that as a shorthand for how long to wash your hands. They just told people in a normal way, wash your hands for 20 seconds. They didn't patronize the life out of them by saying, sing happy birthday while you wash your hands. So that has not traumatized the Danish population the way the happy birthday song has traumatized this population. But um, I don't know if I'm really supposed to continue co-hosting, but I'm going to try my best. Um <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> it's show business. You've just got to keep going. I know. <laughs> just gotta, it just it just keeps going. Starling, if you were to write a new happy birthday song, do you have any ideas what it might be? Like to do with the pandemic, or hopefully us coming no, out just of that. Our happy birthday. Like it's your birthday. It's your birthday. It's your birthday. Um, exactly. That's right. I can that, cry that if I want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Something yeah. like that. Probably the most bratty song. I yeah, lyrics that I could find. Yeah. About just being a brat for 24 hours, like, perfect. And so when you do make this song, could you make sure it's not 20 seconds? So it's never again used never. by any politician to talk about washing hands. I have a question for Colleen and Val. Val, yeah. you've lived through, as we've heard, other pandemics, etc. I guess my question is, did governments issue directives in, you know, at another time that were things like wash your hands and sing happy birthday? Do you think no, but we were certainly instructed to wash carefully. And because my pandemic or epidemic was tuberculosis. Oh, yeah. Viruses are different from bacilluses. Yes. And we just had to avoid any breath or any sputum. So we learned always to face away from our patients and so on. And yes, there was washing and everything we wore had to be washed and boiled and sanitised. Yeah. But the government didn't direct the whole population. They had selected the patients by having a compulsory chest X-ray program mm -hmm. and anybody whose chest X-ray showed up TB were compulsorily treated. Right. And uh, the rest of the population was fine, but, you know, the, the buggers that, that had to be put into sanatoria, they were cut off pretty okay. much from their families. The visiting was heavily restricted. Yes, and yes. And really yes. the nursing staff were their friends and family, really, for the time yeah. that they were there. Deb, Hello. We, we, Deb, we slightly got into tuberculosis. I'm sorry, but I hope you Oh, my mind. God, without us? Well, oh, no, God no, damn. no, no. Well, I mean, it was just a little bit. It was just about I asked whether the government at the time of the pandemics that Colleen and Val are talking about had really condescending, patronizing things like wash your hands and sing happy birthday as opposed to just be sensible, you know, um, because in Denmark, for example, they didn't come up with a little song you had to sing. They were like, wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. Be cool. 
And so it's not a trigger over there because we were talking I about I find it helpful though because I don't know how long 20 seconds is. I would be like, da, 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 that's got to be 20 seconds. No. One of the most extraordinary episodes of The New Normal that I did, which was an Instagram live show I did when we were in the most extreme lockdown here where we were only legally allowed to leave the house once a day and we couldn't see anybody, was the episode I did with you, Sindhu. And you talked about grieving your mother while mm. in lockdown. And it was so raw. I've never experienced anything quite like it because it was just like you opened your chest up and showed us mm. your pulsing humanity. And it was it was mm. extremely surgical, that experience. And I wouldn't call it an interview. We were just sitting together crying and you were telling me all this wisdom. Do you remember what you said about housekeeping? It was like, we can't go out at the moment, so we have to go in. Yeah, we have to go in. It was a complicated moment for me because my mother had passed away. Her one-year anniversary is coming up. And that, you know, you know, I was very close to my mother. But also then I got corona in March. And, of course, my way of dealing with my mother passing away was because I had this howling grief that I was not, I had no way to understand it. And the way I did it was to lean into my work and to just keep on doing it. And then I got corona and that stopped me in my tracks. And looking back, what I realized is, it was like my feet were set in cement because I had no more work and I was so unwell. And then when your feet are set in cement, if you imagine your feet are set in cement, you struggle. And as I struggle, I just broke because I was so sad. And yeah. I think it was that moment that we had this uh, Instagram live, you and I. I think I was speaking to you from a place of intellect. It was a place purely from your heart, if that makes sense. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes. You know, it was like my heart was speaking. My heart was speaking. Mm. And so I remember the biggest insight for me that time was if you cannot go out, you must go in. Because you that's your world. That's the world we have all the time with us. You know, these bodies that we have in our minds, they're our vehicles. But because we have so much on the outside, we don't notice. So, yeah, for no, sure. it was an intense time. It was an intense time. And it taught me a lot. If you're listening at home and you haven't uh, seen it, it is on YouTube and it's very, very beautiful and very, very profound. And because it's Cindy V, of course, it was funny as well uh, because she can't help herself. Even even in grief, even, even suffering from grief. coronavirus while grieving, even she can't grief. help herself. It no. seeps out. What she wants to say seeps out in comedy. Uh, but it's very beautiful. Yes. And uh, Sindhu... You know, you are, I think, in many ways, uh, uniquely placed to co-host today, partly because you have had coronavirus, partly because you were quarantined with children. This episode, we're focusing on lived experience because we have people who have some. But also, uh, I just want to jump in and say I'm yeah. also good for this because I've grown up with my cousin had diphtheria. In India, getting TB is kind of like people get it. So I grew up with people getting these diseases that were not even considered pandemics. They were just out there and you just had to be careful. This is how it is in India. When I was pregnant with my first child, the doctor asked me, have you had chickenpox? And I said, oh, I don't know. I'll call my mom. So I rang my mother and I said, mommy, have I had chickenpox? And she said, uh, you know, one time your face became very swollen, then your eyes were closed and then we put you in the hospital. Uh -huh. and I said, what? That's not chicken pox. <laughs> what was I was in the hospital. She said, yes, you're very young. I thought you will go blind. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, my God. I said, what was it? She said, I think maybe it is a mumps. But because mumps. you are pregnant, it could not be mumps. I'm like, mumps doesn't affect women's mom. OK, what was it? She said, hmm. But you had no dots. You had no dots. I know it is not diphtheria because they did not make a hole in your throat. I was like, this conversation is so weird. Just so disturbing. I was like, I was in a hospital. I couldn't see. I was blind. She said, yes. And then she said to me, every day you would say to me, mommy, it is dark. Open the light. And I used to think, oh, my child is blind. I was like, holy. So I said, can you put dad on? Just put dad on the phone. Because we'd, we'd gone over mumps. We'd gone over diphtheria. And I said to dad, I said, dad, did I have chicken pox? And he said, well, I can tell you with all certainty that you didn't have measles. I was like, okay, you know what? I'm hanging oh up the phone. God. I'm hanging up the phone. Goodbye. <laughs> so... It was so common in India for children to get diseases that parents would then take them to the hospital and the doctor would be like, I'd have to make a hole in your throat because it's diphtheria, that they didn't even bother when the kid came home to really have an idea what it was. And so, by the way, I had to have a test and I had had the chicken pox already, but good But grief. they couldn't remember it. Wow. No, and also, how come no one told me I was blind for five days? It's information it you'd think you'd have. And you can't remember that? No. I mean, I probably have just blacked it out completely. 
typical of my mother to be like, hmm, well, it was not mumps because you can have babies. I'm like, you are literally zero when it comes to medical information, man. <laughs> Well, look, I am glad you survived whatever uh, traumas that your childhood inflicted upon you to be here today. Everybody, please put your hands together and welcome to the mic, the very funny, the very lovely Deborah Francis White. Uh, thank you, thank you. So today we're talking about lived experience. So I thought I would go back into history and find some of the experiences that people have lived, especially around quarantines. Uh, so this is fact number one. Isaac Newton changed our understanding of the universe while in isolation. During the Great Plague in 1665, Isaac Newton was a student at Trinity College, Cambridge, and uh, he retreated home like a lot of students are having to do now. And he had this huge discovery that is integral to understanding our planets and stars because he wasn't like drinking with his mates, putting a traffic cone on his head, uh, snogging at the JCR bop. No, uh, he was just lying there going, this is incredibly boring until brilliant thoughts came into his head. And I have to say that during quarantine, I have learnt a full song and dance routine to Mama Morton's When You're Good to Mama from Chicago. So I think we know who's winning. Number two, the theory of gravity was also born during isolation. Isaac Newton also went off to a country house. While he was there, um, he sat under an apple tree and he had that famous idea that the apple fell down and he was like, why doesn't the apple fall up? Uh, that's how bored he was. And so he discovered gravity. But I, and I think we need to be clear about this, have done the Hamilton Peloton ride. It's half an hour. It's half an hour. I don't know if I've mentioned it, but it's half an hour. And for some of it, you have to stand up. You can't sit in the saddle. Some of the resistances are quite high, 45 resistance, but you're still having to pedal at 110. So it's the same. The Apollo 11 astronauts had to quarantine for two weeks when they came back from the moon in case they had brought back a space flu. So I don't know if anyone saw Mock the Week last night, uh, the comedy panel show, but all of the comedians had glass uh, or uh, perspex uh, walls between them so that they couldn't breathe on each other. Similarly, you can see a picture of Richard Nixon talking to the astronauts who are behind glass. Can you imagine coming back from the moon, wanting to celebrate, wanting a parade for yourself, wanting everyone to hug you, and you have to stay inside for another two weeks? But that leads me on to my next fact. It wasn't really a quarantine because it was only two weeks. And quarren, the quar Quarren means four. The first ever quarantine was actually a Trentino. In 1348, an outbreak of the bubonic plague spread through big European cities, including Venice and Milan. And historical documents show that the port city, known as Dubrovnik now, passed legislation, a law in 1377, saying any incoming ships had to sit for 30 days before anyone was allowed to embark. So it was a Trentino. Do you know why it was raised to Quarantino? Quarantine, Sindhu. So that's my next point. 40 days no uh, for religious reasons, because Jesus fasted in the wilderness for 40 days. Noah's flood was 40 days, 40 nights. There's loads of 40 things in the Bible. So they were like, give it an extra 10 days for God. And that's why it's a quarantine. So unless you have quarantined for 40 days, it's not really a quarantine. It's just isolation. Uh, this brings us on to my more feminist points uh, that you may have heard of someone called Typhoid Mary. This is a woman called Mary Mallon. In the early 20th century, she had typhoid fever. She was an asymptomatic carrier, but she said she absolutely wouldn't uh, seek employment as a family cook if she was allowed to isolate on her own. But she did. And for that, she was sent to North Brother Island in New York, where she was forced to remain in isolation for the rest of her life. Now, the reason I think this is a feminist issue is because she was obviously under-resourced. If you're ill, you don't go off, even if you're asymptomatic, to try and get work as a cook unless you're going to die of starvation and poverty. And this is very, very typical of the patriarchy. And we know it was definitely a patriarchal move because she was sent to North Brother Island. Questioning it. Poor Typhoid Mary. And she was called Typhoid Mary as well. I mean, it's sort of insult to injury, isn't it? And uh, finally, on a feminist point, one of the most famous science fiction novels ever was written by an author in isolation. And it was a female author. It was... Frankenstein. 
Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, absolutely. Uh, now, the reason this is a feminist issue is because she was raised by Mary Wollstonecraft, her mother, who was really our first great big proto-feminist. She was a throbbing, fizzing women's rights activist, Mary Wollstonecraft, way ahead of her time. And her daughter married, well, she wasn't really raised by her, I don't think, because she died when Mary Shelley was a baby. She might have died in childbirth, actually, because people did uh, then a lot. Um, but, you know, you, she knew her mother's legacy. And uh, she then ran off with Percy Shelley, who, I mean, people argue about how much of a feminist he was. He was a massive womanizer. He'd left his previous wife and baby to go off with Mary Shelley, who was only herself, or Mary Godwin, as she was then 16. And this is a story about a man who makes another living thing and then abandons it. So I think that was playing on her mind. Um, and I am going to suggest that Frankenstein is a feminist novel, but she was in isolation with a man who was definitely not a feminist. She herself had the feminist genes. And then finally, finally, entire governments have fled past outbreaks and isolated together. Uh, a yellow fever outbreak struck the city of Philadelphia in 1793 and the whole government went off. Uh, King Charles II and his entire court packed up and went to Salisbury during the Great Plague. I'm just popping it out there to our current government. If you were interested, Boris Johnson, Pretty Patel, Michael Gove, in fucking the fuck off somewhere else and isolating yourself and letting, I don't know, Sindhu and me have a go. We'd be great. Let the, all the guilty feminist regulars in. We'll take your spots. Pretty Patel, I'll absolutely keep your seat warm. Pretty Patel, I almost look like you. I'll even keep that Excellent. going. Excellent. Great. Sindhu V will come in and she will definitely promise to keep up all your horrifying and vicious immigration policies. Don't worry. Don't worry. Just go off. Go off. Out of Hebrides. Turn your phone off. Have a holiday isolate. Why not? When you come back, we promise that everything will be just like you wanted it to be. A great big horrifying chaotic mess. If we accidentally clean anything up for you, we apologise in advance. And those are my quarantine facts. Uh, I, got, I got a lot of those from interestingengineering.com and there are more there if you would like to see them. Jokes were my own. Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. As you probably know, I'm sometimes asked to go to conferences and speak to people in business about things like diversity and inclusion, creativity, and how you can better include yourself and include others. During lockdown, I've been delivering these talks from home, and now for the first time, I'm making some of these ideas available to everyone. I'll be doing three live Skill Booster webinars over Zoom every Thursday at 2 p.m. from the 12th to the 27th of November and you can get your tickets now. We've tried to make these as affordable as we can. If you've got a good job or you can get your company to pay for them, they're 60 quid each or all three for 150. If you're out of work or you're a student or an NHS worker, we have a small number available for just £10 each or £25 for all three. And if you support us on Patreon, you can get a special exclusive discount code there. For more information and to book, see the links in the show notes or on our website, guiltyfeminist.com. And speaking of Patreon, if you're supporting us, you get access to special hangout events where you get to spend some quality time with me, ask me questions and get some exclusive scoops. For November, we've got something even better. I'll be spending an evening with Grace Petrie so you can ask her questions about her life. Uh, I'll do a Q&A with her. She'll sing songs, uh, covers, all sorts. And that will be on Thursday, the 12th of November. You'll be, even be able to see her singing her new live lockdown hit. But you have to be a Patreon supporter to get access to it. Uh, so sign up if that sounds like something you would like to do. Turn Up the World is the worldwide online festival that brings your favourite musicians straight to you. The core mission of the festival is to create community, help each other and enjoy some fantastic music. But the festival is raising money for Campaign Against Living Miserably and Fair Share to provide meals for struggling families and mental health support during the Christmas holidays, a notoriously difficult time of year. Tune into their Instagram page at Turn Up the World from the 11th to the 13th of December to join in the festivities. Our Be Well workshops are still running with amazing teachers running workshops on yoga, mindfulness and movement. Go to guiltyfeminist.com slash be hyphen well to book your place now. All the money goes to the teachers and the administrator.
And lastly, our merch store is still open for business with all the Guilty Feminist mugs, t-shirts, notebooks and tote bags you could want. They all make excellent Christmas presents. And so does my book, The Guilty Feminist, available wherever books are sold. Thanks to everyone who's kept us going this year by supporting the podcast. Whether it's being a Patreon supporter, buying our merch, coming to our live shows or just being a listener and telling other people about the show. If you've rated, reviewed and subscribed, look, honestly, we couldn't keep doing it without you. So thank you very much indeed. And now back to the podcast. Our first guest today is a best-selling author, presenter, political commentator, and the chief creative officer for the Nine Network's Future Women. She was named one of Australia's 100 Women of Influence by the Australian Financial Review and holds the 2020 Victoria Award for Excellence in Women's Leadership. Please welcome back to the podcast, Jamila Rizvi. Hey! So excited. She is joined by Colleen Hickman, who survived diphtheria as a child and was quarantined alone for several weeks, and Val Riley who was a tuberculosis nursing aide after the war and later raised four children as a single mother. So welcome, Jamila, Colleen and Val. So Jamila, firstly, uh, could you set the scene? Because you've written a book while in quarantine about these previous experiences. You've interviewed lots of women who've got lived experience to bring to us about previous pandemics and how they can share that with us to help us as human beings, uh, women or or people of minority genders, uh, feminists, activists, survivors. (laughs) What can you tell us, Jamila, about this process of writing the book? What made you do it? Well, this has been an extraordinarily enjoyable and like I've got to say, life-affirming project during lockdown in Melbourne, in Australia. We've been one of the most lockdown cities in the world, despite relatively low coronavirus numbers. We've been in some something very close to a stage four of isolation, so being allowed out one hour a day to exercise only for almost 150 days now. Oof. So it's been, it's been almost an intense quarantines. time. It's been an intense time. Yeah. So um, early on in the pandemic, I really wanted to talk to my nan. I remembered her stories of the tuberculosis epidemic in Australia. I remembered her stories about um, polio and diphtheria. And she was one of my favourite people and heartily sensible as well as uh, wonderful to chat to. She's not around anymore. My nan died uh, in 2013. So I went searching for other extraordinary intelligent women who had lived through a period like this before and I went searching for women because I didn't want the men because the history is books are written by the men and I've got that perspective and I've got quite enough of that perspective so I went searching for 19 uh, individuals who and have turned out to be definitely the great highlight of 2020 chatting to them. Wonderful absolutely wonderful how did you find such people? Actually Sindhu will understand this it was a bit like an Indian family gossip chain because it was a bit of like, okay, I'll talk to the neighbour and then the neighbour's sister knows somebody from church who has to tell me about her dog's keeper who helped on a holiday and they've got an uncle and suddenly you've got all the people. We went through enormous chains of person who knew person who knew person uh, to find the 19 women who are part of this book. And um, it's really exciting to have two of them with us today. Yes, absolutely. And let's bring them in. Colleen Hickman, can you tell us something about what you told Jam for the book? Of course, yes. Well, I'm talking about when I was nine year old and diphtheria as TB and um, scarlet fever, polio, all those things were around the same time. And diphtheria affected we children probably quite a bit. And one little girl across the road from me died. I came from Adelaide. And my sister had what we thought was diphtheria and turned out to be streptococci, which is a very similar thing. You have swabs in the nose and the throat. However, that was streptococci, but mine turned out to be diphtheria. And so I was taken away to a hospital in Adelaide called Northfield Infectious, And I think my first memory of that was pretty horrific to me because I was put in a bath of phenyl water. Uh, Phenyl at those times, it was a very strong, you would know, Val, very strong um, antiseptic, I suppose, uh, 
to keep you clean and it was filed. And I can remember that vividly and also the nervousness of being uh, on my own probably for the first time like that and wondering what it was all about. How old were and you, Colleen? I was about nine. Oh, I'm now 85, God. so forgive me if my memory's not spot on, but I know no, that diphtheria was a frightening thing, as polio and TB was. TB more when I was a little older and I had a friend that contacted it and we all had to have x-rays. It was compulsory. We had to have an x-ray for TB and then you were put in isolation for a matter of weeks of things, but it would leave a thing on your lung. So it was something that you dreaded. With the diphtheria, um, I unfortunately also happened to have a contact with somebody out in the hospital and got chicken pox. Oh, and I know Val was talking. No, yes, I think it was you, Sindhu, <laughs> talking about chicken pox. And that's quite true. Actually, I felt very sick with chicken pox because yeah. it's a bad rash and, yeah. and if you scratch them, they would become scabs, yeah. sores. And so between the two things, it was a pretty scary thing, but I felt that I was being looked after and I came from a very secure family that always I felt safe with and I knew that they would be there watching that everything would be all right. But you couldn't see your own parents or anybody. I think I was there for about five to six weeks, mainly because the chicken pox came in on top of the diphtheria, so that extended my time. But I lived through it, and as many other children did, but it was a scare at the time, the same as scarlet fever. That was another one that was a worry to us all. But then when the TB came... Uh, I know I had an aunt and it was you couldn't have utensils that she used. We had to be so careful of anything we touched that belonged to that lady or that person, I should say. So there was always that element in the back of your mind, I've got to be careful, I've got to be clean. And though they didn't push you to wash your hands, it was definitely something that you would do. And just to be clean, everything to be you know, have antiseptic and things like that. But the scary part, I think, was being in a hospital for the first time in my life and not wondering what it's all about, why I can't see my parents, why I can't have visitors. And they couldn't come and see you because you were just totally quarantined as a nine-year-old. Well, my mother told me afterwards when I, you know, was all over everything that actually our house, we lived in a little row of cottages in Adelaide at the time, and they actually fumigated our house. You know, we had, mum had to said that they sealed up windows and door frames and that, and then they must have come in with some sort of vacuum or something that actually fumigated the house. So for quite a while in that era, until we got, you know, penicillin and vaccines and everything, it was always something at the back of your mind. And how do you so feel yes. now at the other end of your life? Is this a shock to you that this is happening again? When you thought, oh, well, we've sort of got past this. This is something from my childhood and how much science has progressed. And how does that feel? Yeah, you're right, Deb. I think we had got to the stage where we thought we were pretty safe because of the vaccines that were out there to help people So from Our little babies onwards had their injections regularly and we made sure they did. And anyone out there that doesn't have their child immunised is very foolish because it is some way of holding things down and you must be aware of that. It's so easy to translate a germ. I think the I the anti-vaxxer movement is in response to people not being able to remember these communicable diseases and how awful they were and how many children died. It's hardly in living memory anymore. And that's why, Colleen, it's really important for you to share that lived experience and say, this is what it was like. I was rushed off, you know, before we had vaccines, I, I was rushed off and suddenly put into isolation without my parents and put into a bath of something horrible. I also want to say that the anti-vaxxer movement is almost exclusively in places where if something goes wrong, there's a hospital and a doctor next door. Mm-hmm. You see, yes. so not only is it not about living memory, which I think is a very, very good point, and it's true, it's also about people who take for granted that 
they'll make a choice. And if it goes in their face and everything goes to shit, someone will rescue them. You see, yes. when I hear Colleen speaking, and I remember, you know, Colleen is speaking about getting sick in a way that then your parents and you had no choices. You were taken away to a hospital. You were stuck in a bath of phenyl. Phenyl is a disinfectant. Oh, it's a horrible be, thing. It's, 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 it's crazy. And I mean, I remember when my cousin got typhoid, or was it tuberculosis? There I go. I'm like my mother. I can't remember. It was one of the two. The house was always being wiped down with phenyl. You can barely breathe. That's and right. Some, so I find the anti-vaxxer thing lives in a vacuum of reality about what it is when you don't have a choice, which I think mm -hmm. in Colleen's time, you didn't have a choice. Even now in India with COVID-19, if there's someone in your home that gets COVID, the government comes and puts a yellow tape outside and a sign uh -huh. on your door. And so because India is still a country where in, in my childhood, people could remember losing children to communicable diseases. You see what I mean? And right yes. now with COVID-19, it's so awful. I have some family and some cousins. One person got diagnosed, <laughs> put a sign on the door and no one wants to even come near your house. So there's all these social ramifications that I think make the experience of a pandemic different in different places. But just to anyway, come back to the anti-vaxxer thing, it's something that really annoys me mm -hmm. because it's kind of wrapped up in this thing about science and oh the children and do we really know what they're being vaccinated with yes but you know that if it goes in your face you could go to a doctor mm -hmm. it's generally in very privileged areas as well yeah. people in india aren't going oh no we'll take our chances with polio yeah, super, super wealthy super wealthy privileged people in india are not anti-vaxxers because mm -hmm. they see every day what it is you know mm -hmm. i um have been in hospital recently in melbourne for unrelated the COVID issues, but I went into hospital and into emergency and I had a really slight temperature when I went in, which meant straight away I couldn't go to a ward, couldn't leave emergency, could only go to the COVID possible ward. And I was just listening to Colleen's story just then and thinking about about a week ago for me what it was like properly being sealed off with plastic, guys in hazmat suits, one nurse only, I quickly said, oh, there's no bathroom. And they were like, yeah, you can't use the bathrooms. There's communal bathrooms on the floor. No one uses the bathrooms on this floor. And I was like, okay, what about a shower? And they were just like, we'll deal with that when it comes. We'll see what your COVID test says. And um, it was a really isolating, terrifying experience. And I was 99% sure I was fine. And at 1am they barged in and said, you are okay. You need to leave and march me off to another ward. But I, just, I, I think about... Um, Colleen's story particularly about being isolated as a little kid, not 10, you know, for five, six weeks away from your mum and dad, just must have been completely terrifying, completely terrifying. Absolutely, absolutely. Val, tell us your story and what you contributed to the book. Oh, well, my main part, oh, I don't know, contributed a fair bit about my life in general because Jamila's that sort of person. She gets all sorts of stuff out of you. But what we're here to talk about is dealing with an epidemic, really. Now, when I grew up, I had the usual childhood diseases, measles, mumps, whooping cough, and you know, there weren't inoculations against them in those days. But I didn't get the next lot, like diphtheria and scarlet fever and those. But there was a big scare about polio, mm. and we were terrified. I know our parents were terrified if we had the slightest ache or pain or sniffle that we might end up with polio. But anyway, survived all that and um, went to work at a tuberculosis sanatorium and uh, went there mainly because I couldn't afford to live unless I was living in and having it all, all my keep paid for. But it was a wonderful job. I really loved it. When I first went there, people were looking, well, most of them were skin and bone. They'd been sometimes on complete bed rest for two or three years because that was the only known treatment, total bed rest and fresh wow. air. And, you know, they used to send the wealthy to Switzerland to sanatoriums there, didn't they? Mm. There were three major sanatoriums on the outskirts of Melbourne, just on rises where they got the freshest of air and they had beautifully designed buildings, especially to look after TB. And they looked after the staff extraordinarily well. We were living in 
and we were well fed. And I remember Matron used to actually serve our meals so that she could make sure that we were eating properly. And then on the wards, the total bed rest people, we had to look after completely. And the big thing was to make sure that they didn't get bed sores. So we were constantly straightening the sheets and massaging them with methylated spirits and that kind of thing. But then I hadn't been there very long when the sulfur drugs came in, um, streptomycin and PAS, I forget what PAS stands for, but they were sulfur drugs. And these people that we were sure wouldn't last a month were in weeks or months standing up, walking around and eventually leaving. It wow. It was extraordinary to be part of that. Were you worried every day you were going to catch it? Well, they looked after us extremely well and they disciplined us very much. You know, we knew how not to take in the breath or the sputum of other people and we were... Oh, can you teach us that? (laughs) Can you teach us that? How do you not take in someone else's infected breath? Well, you always turn your head away. You you never look straight at a patient while you're dealing with them. Right. Were you masked the whole time? No, we didn't Uh, use masks. uh, uh. And, uh, you know, that's one of the big differences with this particular epidemic. But all of the clothing we wore was boilable and was changed frequently. And, you know, we didn't have hair flopping around. That always had to be up and out of the way. And we didn't have, you know, stuff hanging around, dangling on. You know, a lot of the practices these days horrify me because they are so obviously liable to be transferring germs of one kind or another from patient to patient. You must have been a very young woman. Did it affect your dating possibilities? Because if you, it, <clears throat> So when you were in a bar and, you know, you'd gone out for a night all dressed up and a young man was chatting to you or a young woman, I don't want to make assumptions and be heteronormative, <laughs> but you were chatting to someone in a bar and they said, what do you do? And you went, oh, I work on a tuberculosis ward with loads of very ill and very fatally ill patients. Did they not go, oh, oh, was that the well, time? And back away. I'm saying I'm a nurse. You just said you're a nurse. You didn't say. Didn't say. Yes, Good. They yeah. asked you the will, yes. But look, we were confident. And there was a kind of vaccination. It wasn't a particularly reliable one, but we all had a BCG needle that lifted our immunity, but certainly wasn't anything like a, a complete vaccine. You know, we got to know those patients, and that, because they were cut off from their families, we were like their friends and, and family, and we worked mainly... I loved working on the female wards because I understood how females <laughs> operated, I suppose, and they often asked you for more looking after than the men did. You know, like pass me that ball of wool or go and get that for me or something, but you knew that they were doing something constructive. Whereas the days we were on the men's ward, I would come home just miserable because they were such complaining buggers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway... So- you know, we can learn things from history, but some things never change. This pandemic is absolutely the worst because it's hit oh, so yes. many people it, all over the world all at once. It's not yeah. like it's something that's only in one one area for a while or for a couple of years. This is something yes, well, that's the pandemic is very ev- different everywhere. Different and the ones that and about I can it. understand how, how people are getting anxiety because of it because... You start feeling perhaps, you know, you're a bit diseased. Nobody wants to go near you. They don't like our state because there could be a problem. And I think that part of it is really showing itself up with this particular pandemic. It's it's very worrying. I also think this one is so contagious. That's, mm -hmm. you know, I remember with like, as you were saying, with diphtheria or tuberculosis, if someone didn't spit on you, then you weren't going to get it. You see what I mean? Whereas yes. with this, it's so yes. contagious. Degrees of infectiousness are interesting. When we were first being trained to nurse tuberculosis, one of the first things that we were told was that TB was more infectious than leprosy. Oh, my and God. Really? Scary. Really? Until you know that leprosy isn't all that infectious. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, leprosy wasn't infectious in that way. You had to really, I mean, 
Yeah. I've even, it's crazy now that you mention it because I remember there was leprosy when I was growing up. It was called Gore. We used to go to temples on big occasions to feed the poor. And you would have one section, which was just all people with leprosy. And you weren't allowed to get close to them and feed them because they might touch you. Oh, my God. And so you had to feed them from a distance, but you always fed them first. My mother used to say, Kodhiyon ko pehle khilao. Feed them first. Because no one even wants to see them. And now that I'm talking on this podcast, I'm remembering so many things. I genuinely have not thought about leprosy for the last 30 years, let's be honest. But it's coming back the way different infectious diseases were treated in a person. The fear of leprosy was strong for my age group because of the church, you know, because of yeah. the Bible studies and talking about leprosy. And it was such a fearsome thing. You would be terrified if you even would have known. Luckily, it didn't sort of come into Australia as such anyway, but it was just the fear of something like that could come. And it was a horrible thing, leprosy. You know, it was a scary oh. thing to think about, you see, because of the way it was explained to you what would happen. But so thank God, you know, we didn't sort of have that pandemic of something like that in our countries. Colleen and Val, is there anything you learnt when you were younger from living through these things that is wisdom we should have and we should know? Well, definitely you have to be aware of cleanliness, definitely, in all shapes, not just with your hands but, you know, with your bathroom things and anything around the house To You need to keep clean with our shops and with our foods and things like that. Cleanliness is probably number one, like godliness. It was taught to us as little kids, you know, to be yeah. clean. And uh, I think that's important. And I think also the fact that if somebody is uh, struck with something like uh, COVID is, they do need to do something about it, not just think it'll go away. Because whilst they may get over it, Depends a lot on, you know, the kind of person you are, I suppose. That where we have lived through this kind of epidemic before, not anything like this pandemic, you know, for the last hundred years, and it will pass. I mean, we're right. all, particularly in Melbourne, we're pitching about being locked in and shut down and not being able to do anything much. God knows the last time I had a haircut, for example. But it will pass and we just have to put up with the inconvenience and know that sooner or later, sooner or later, probably much later, a vaccine will develop. But in the meantime, we've got to depend on our own cleanliness and our own carefulness not to spread and not to pick up the infection. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in terms of our mental health that you know about because you're perhaps from a generation that had lower expectations of convenience and oh, look, luxury. I don't know and... how we'd have survived if we didn't have the electronic communication that we have these days. You know, if I'd been locked away, say, 50 years ago, without the kinds of communication that we have, I don't know how I'd have survived. I mean, not to be able to go to gym, not to be able to sing in choir, that's the hardest thing for me. And God knows, you know, when... We will be able to go back to... Yeah, that's a particularly unsafe thing to do at the moment. Yeah, but it will pass. This too shall pass. Val, that's a great point because, you know, when you've lived through things, you think at the time, oh, God, is this ever going to go away? Diphtheria, you know, this time, this war, yeah. this... But this too shall pass. And that's a great thing to hold on to. Jamila, oh, I, I want to come back to you because, you know, you compiled all sorts of things. Is there anything in the book you would like to read us or tell us about? Sure thing. The 19 women we spoke to for this book have lived, I think, what you'd describe as extraordinary, ordinary lives. We haven't gone and spoke to queens and prime ministers and at movie stars. We've talked to supposedly ordinary Australian women, Australian now, about six or seven of them were born in different parts of the world. And each of them had amazing wisdom to impart and each of them to a person including Colleen and Val 
when I first spoke to them, said, I'm not interesting enough to be in a book. Mm, true. Um, and you would never find a bloke in the history of the world <laughs> that didn't think he was interesting enough to be in a book. And you were all wrong because the book's very interesting. Um, but I think uh, there's so many moments that stuck with me, Deb, but one of them was actually from Val. We were talking about uh, Val's childhood during the Depression and the Second World War and talking about living on rations. And one of the things uh, you said to me, Val, on one of our 10,000 phone calls was that it wasn't so bad because everyone was doing it, that there was less of a sense of deprivation because you were all doing it together. And I mentioned that I've been really sick the last few years. I've spent most of the last few years stuck in a bed inside and not going out. And this is easier because at a personal level. Because everybody's doing it. Because everyone's doing it. Because we're in it together. And I think when we talk about the mental health sides of this, obviously we should all be speaking to professionals who can support us and help us through this. But I think we should just be talking to each other. Because as one of the sick people... And it's mostly the sick and the elderly, but as one of those vulnerable people who will die if they get COVID, I'm extraordinarily grateful to everybody else. I'm extraordinarily you- grateful for everyone to staying home because you're keeping the rest of us safe. And for all the people out there that don't or haven't got someone around them, loneliness is one of the worst things in the world. To feel alone, doing something alone and not having someone to support you. I think particularly for the elderly, that is really hard. But even for the young ones, they're missing a hug with their mates and being able to converse and swap stories that keeps one. If you share a problem with someone, it halves your problem. And that way we're missing out on that because we're not communicating with each other. So if you're feeling down, it's really good when you've got a good friend or a child or a person that you love. Or someone you just know the lady next door, just to be able to sit and have a talk, that relieves a lot of the pressure of anxiety away from you, for sure. It's a really good point, and we must be vigilant about our elderly relatives and uh, anyone who's alone that we're not sure has a strong, connected group of friends. I started a WhatsApp group for three friends of mine who were isolated alone when we were in the most isolated period. And they didn't know each other, but that WhatsApp group is very active. They talk every day, just share things, frustrations, good things they're celebrating, little funny pictures, videos. And it really does help. I finally convinced my mum to get an iPad uh, so that we can see each other when we speak and uh, send each other little messages. And and it does help. It really, really, really does help. And there are places, look them up for where you can donate. If you've got old phones or iPads that still work lying around laptops that you can donate because some people can't afford it. And if you can give something, especially that can be on like a 3G or a 4G so that they don't have to also get Wi-Fi, it makes a very, very, very big difference. Jamila, anything else you want to tell us about your book or anything you want to tell us about anything anyone said in the book? No, I suppose I'll just say that one of the most joyful things about um putting Untold Resilience together was talking to women from so many different backgrounds, women from different cultural backgrounds who'd survived wars, who'd been refugees, uh, women who'd lived through extreme poverty, uh, women who'd transitioned. I talked to one of the first lesbian ministers in the Uniting Church in Australia who has copped an extraordinary amount of shit in her life to get to where she is and is now in uh, her 80s and had a lot to say about being resilient. And It was a real reminder to me that we often group in friendships around and our groups of connection around those who are around the same age as us. And sometimes I wonder why we do that Uh, because it's been such such a privilege and so much fun getting to know these women. And if only the government let me go outside my five kilometre zone, I would go and visit (laughs) some of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'd but, always you know, be welcome. I always feel like talking to older people is like traveling in time. Uh, we had two 90 something year old women on who were talking about being code breakers in the second world war. And I was like, I mean, most of their stories were about nightclubs and boys, to be honest. And I loved it. I was like, it felt like being there it felt like, you know, and reading their letters in their book, it felt like I was there. So treasure elderly relatives and friends 
Or, you know, you can partner. There are schemes and programs where you can partner with someone who's elderly who might not have any friends or relatives uh, who would appreciate you checking in with them every day. And you can learn so much. So I really, really recommend that. Feminism sometimes can be a bit ageist. It can forget that intersection of the community and think, oh, we have nothing to learn. But, you know, women who pioneered before, my God, you know, there's so much that they can teach us. And I feel very grateful to Colleen and Val today for coming and talking to us. Is there anything else you came to say you didn't say, Colleen and Val, that you were desperate to say and you you didn't say? No, I did like to say Jamila. I think it's a wonderful thing that she's done and uh, it has brought back a lot of memories and... I guess there'll be a lot more that we've added on now with this particular pandemic. And uh, I, I just hope it'll be all over soon. We have a vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this brings us on to Donatella. Because this is not just about what we can learn from older people, but how we treat older people. And that is a big part of our feminism. Donatella Rivera is from Amnesty International. Donatella, could you tell us something about how we are treating our elderly at the moment in this country? Um, Well, I'll start by saying that this was an entirely new era of work for me. I normally investigate war crimes and crimes against humanity in wars around the world. So that's what I've been doing for the past more than 20 years, working in very different setting where horrible things happen somewhere far where a terrible war is going on. And this time I worked very close to home. Um, I finished this piece of work on the UK and I'm doing the same in Italy, Spain and Belgium. And it's about how older people in care homes have been treated. First of all, they were completely invisible. Our government here in the UK was not even counting how many people in care homes were dying of COVID in the daily fig. Yes, for weeks, the daily figures that the prime minister and other minister were giving every day of how many fatalities were being recorded uh, from COVID-19 did not include people who died in care homes. That is shocking in itself. And what is even more shocking is that out of a 60 something million population in England, because this research focuses on England as opposed to other countries in the UK, 400,000 people live in care homes. Out of those 400,000, you know, those 400,000 people took the brunt because close to 40% of the COVID death wearing care homes. Why did that happen so disastrously? Because at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the UK government, having seen what was happening in Italy with, you know, a health system completely overwhelmed for different reasons, because COVID in Italy was in a very small part of the country, northern Italy, and the health system there was overwhelmed. Here they had a lot of time to prepare. So they decided that they would protect the NHS. And in order to do that, they discharged 25,000 people from hospital infected with COVID, not tested into care homes, knowing that the most vulnerable people were the people living in care homes because of age and because of comorbidities. People who are older and in very good health they are normally not living in care homes. Those who live in care homes are the most vulnerable. And the decision was made to discharge 25,000 people uh, without having been tested or having been tested positive into care homes, even though there was no need to do that or anything like that because hospitals had hundreds of Each hospital uh, had hundreds of spare beds. We never reached capacity. We had the special Nightingale's hospitals that were never used in many areas. Yeah, I I remember that. So uh, having uh, decided to send a whole lot of people who were infected with COVID into the places where the most vulnerable 
where. At the same time, the guidelines were also completely haphazard. Like the uh, guidelines were that there was nothing that needed to be done differently in care homes, that care home staff didn't need to uh, wear PPE. And there was a reason for that is because care home staff didn't have PPE uh, unless, you know, the care homes had kind of managed to get some because uh, government wasn't providing it. Uh, now, normally care homes have to provide for themselves. They are private companies. But in times of pandemic, they could not be expected to find new supply lines. At the same time, GPs were instructed that they did not need to go into care homes. And so we had care home staff with no medical qualification who had to interpret the symptoms of people in care homes who were sick and who couldn't explain their symptoms for either because they were not well enough or because they didn't have enough mental capacity. And so unqualified care staff had the additional responsibility to explain to doctors what the symptoms were. And doctors would, uh, at the other end of the phone, then make decision to prescribe sometimes end-of-life care. Um, older people in care homes were not granted access to hospital, even though there was plenty of space in hospital. Um, care home managers and staff told us that they were heavily discouraged or they were outright refused um, sending patients, uh, people who were sick, some of their residents were sick to hospital. Some fought and managed to send uh, their residents to hospital when they were sick and people recovered. Uh, so there was this presumption that if you were in a care home and you were getting COVID or something that might have been COVID because no doctor was going to come in and diagnose you on that basis, if you know, if that's what it was, it was just presumed that you would die. Whereas in those cases where care home fought, people who were 95, 97, 103 went to hospital and got uh, looked after and came back and they're well. There was also like specific guidance that was put out again, government to GPs and uh, general practitioner doctors and doctor surgeries to care home, telling care homes to put a blanket, do not attempt resuscitation on every single one of the care home residents. And that happened for thousands of people without consultation, without normally these are decisions. Without discussing that with their families. Without discussing it with anyone. A blanket, which is not just unethical, but is damn right unlawful. Yeah, it's unlawful. Uh, it's got to be illegal. You can't just say, oh, don't that resuscitate is anyone in a care home. So Absolutely. What, what can we do to tell our government that we don't want this? and that this is horrifying and this is just showing a flagrant disregard for the life of anybody who is elderly. It's not, you know, these it sounds like just a death warehouse. It's just like, ah, oh, old people, we don't care. Just put a big sign on the door that says, you're all going to die. We're not going to have doctor's visit. We're not going to resuscitate you. We're not going to bother with you. And that speaks to the way more broadly we see elderly people in our community, if that's how we're treating people in care homes, it feels like the government doesn't care about anybody who's older. Well, first of all, yes. I mean, I found this, you know, really shocking to see that in our countries, you know, the UK is one of the richest countries in the world. And some of the same patterns we've identified in other European countries. Again, these are the richest countries in the world where uh, we can look after people. There are spaces in hospitals that, you know, these were not decisions that were made on the basis of needs. Um, there are three short things that we can do to let our governments know that this isn't good enough and that they need to do things differently. First of all, there should be a full public inquiry and not one of those that last years, but with a, an immediate interim phase that can report back within the next few weeks so that we can ensure that lessons are learned and that the same terrible, disastrous, reckless decisions are not made again. Uh, secondly, every do not attempt resuscitation note that was put on the medical 
file of any care home residents after the 1st of March should be removed immediately. That is something that government can order in a three line letter and it can be done. And so that all of those unlawfully imposed do not attempt resuscitation notice are removed. And thirdly, what we are seeing right now today is a, once again attempts to send infected patients infected with COVID from hospitals into care homes. Letters have gone out just last week from local authorities asking care homes, how many beds can you make available for COVID patients? Why? Because keeping somebody in hospital costs from, you know, a thousand pounds a day. Keeping somebody in a care home is much, much, much cheaper. But again, the risk of it's like throwing a match into a haystack. It's not a good idea and it shouldn't happen. So so can we go to the Amnesty website and are there petitions there? Do we write to our MP? What do we do about this? Uh, you can go to the amnesty.org.uk website. There is an action there to write to uh, Secretary of uh, Health and Social Care to ask him to do all of the actions that I mentioned before. And it's very important for people to also write to their MP, to their local authorities, and to let them know that this is not acceptable. Okay, so write to your MP, go on the Amnesty website, and wherever you are in the world, you can visit your Amnesty website and get involved because really, honestly, it does work. All sorts of issues are fixed because uh, ministers, uh, representatives, and even whole countries are embarrassed into action when enough people go, this is awful and we're shining a light on this and you think you're getting away with this, but you're not. So the more people listening to this who can do it, the better. Just we join Amnesty wherever you are and check out what they're highlighting and what they're asking for your help with because these are feminist issues and it's just such a simple, easy way. Every single day you can do an Amnesty action. It'll take you 30 seconds to a minute and it means every single day you've done something for feminism, you've done something compassionate to make the world a better place and it feels like it doesn't work. It does work if enough of us do it absolutely does. And this is a disgrace to our country and an embarrassment. And, you know, these are real people. This is, you know, you think you're going to always be young. You're not. One day it's going to be you. One day it's going to be me. And you're going to hope that some young person doesn't see you as disposable because, you know, it's not just that you're at the end of your life. It's that you feel like you're a burden. You're at the end of your usefulness. No one cares about you. You've been locked away and there's no care taken of you. You know, everyone's got to die at some point, but we've had nurses on the show before talking about giving people a good death as well. And even if you're in a care home close to death, a good death is not, no doctor will come and see you. They'll move a load of really infected people in so that you catch something where you can't breathe and you die of not being able to breathe. That is not a good death. So it doesn't matter how close someone is to death. We need to be compassionate and caring in our society. So get on the Amnesty website, wherever you are, if you're in this country and you're particularly interested in this issue, amnesty.org.uk. All of those individuals were once young people. They were all your age at one point if they've got to their age and they're still that person inside and they need you to care about them. Donatella, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Is there anything you came to say you didn't get to say? Uh, no, that's all. And I would just add that since we've published this report and we've launched this action, we've already seen some reaction, some tiny little improvement announced by the government. A lot more needs to be done. Yeah. So they, get, they get embarrassed very easily. They see what they can, can get away with and they get embarrassed very easily. So, And they know that they cannot hold on to power when they're doing the most despicable things, although they have just said no free lunches for children who children. are going to be starving in the holidays. Oh. So you, one oh. wonders if they do care how embarrassing they are because they're basically Dickensian now. We've still got to try, we've still got to push. Jamila. Um, yes, on the Dickensian tell, note. On that Dickensian note, can you tell us the name of your book? Because I'm desperate to read it and send it to my mum as well. Uh, the book is called Untold Resilience, uh, Stories of Courage, Survival and Love from Women Who Have Gone Before. And there are 19 uh, stories of women and transgender women. I can't tell you how different each story is and how much each one will stay with you. And I think, as you can tell just from chatting earlier, um, each of the journalists have become so close to the women that they interviewed because we just spent so much time together during lockdown when we couldn't spend time with anyone else. For sure, for sure. Well, I'm I'm loving it. And uh, can we get that book all over the world? It's not just available in Australia. 
Yeah, absolutely. You can buy it on uh, you can buy it on Book Depository, or you can buy it uh, through Booktopia in countries that have Booktopia. And we will put a link to that in the show notes. Now, at the other end of the scale, you've also got a book for children because you, although you've been uh, very ill yourself, you have not wasted a second. You're like Isaac Newton in lockdown. Uh, you've done a book for children as well. Can you quickly tell us about that? Yeah, I've got a new children's book out. It's called I'm a Hero 2. I wrote it because my kid was four at the start of the pandemic. And when I went looking for resources. A four-year-old? Yeah. Now five. He's turned five since the pandemic. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> um, he's enormous now. Um, but he, everything I looked for resource-wise to talk to him about coronavirus was just pictures of spiky green balls with angry faces. And I was like, no, it's not, it's not the vibe I'm looking for. I wanted something to help him deal with the emotions of what was happening and I wanted something that would help him grieve. I know that's a really big word for little people, but little people have to grieve as well. You know, yeah. he, he didn't start footy this year. He misses ballet. He doesn't know why he can't go to swimming lessons. He doesn't understand why I say you can play with the kids in the street but you can't get off your bike, you can't touch each other. Like you all can't of that have is, a fifth birthday party. Yeah, we can't go see Granny because the border is literally shut. That's a lot for a little person. So this book's called I'm a Hero Too and it's about helping kids acknowledge what they've given up and what they're missing and what they've lost but also recognising why they've given it up and why they've lost it and recognising them as heroes of the pandemic because they are. Most of them aren't going to die of COVID. They're little kids. They're going to be all right. They are literally giving up everything for the rest of us. Yeah. Well, I love that and I can't believe that during this pandemic, you have had the wherewithal to write a book uh, capturing the experiences of the elderly who have so much wisdom to give us and also a book for children, helping them understand it, covering the bases at both ends of life. We love you on this podcast always. Well, we'll put your books in the show notes. Everyone should get them. I'm going to get them. Sindhu V, have you got anything to plug, anything you came to say you didn't get to say or anything to plug anywhere we should find you? Well, you can find me on all the socials. Like, I mean, how many Sindhus are doing comedy? Frankly, one. So just put Sindhu comedy and I'll show up. <laughs> S-I-N-D-H-U-V. S-I-N-D-H-U rhymes with Hindu in case you ever get confused. Was it, was it Sindhi? No, it's not Hindi. It's Hindu, so Sindhu. That's that. What I do want to plug a little bit is um, it's another podcast. Am I allowed to do that? Yeah. We, oh, we let people listen to other podcasts on this podcast. Oh, really? Okay. You're so magnanimous. Yeah. I, I, if I had a podcast like this, I'd be like, no. <laughs> anyway, a slight dictator. Um, it's called Child Labor, and it's a podcast I've done with Stuart Goldsmith. And it's about how we were parented and then how we parent. And the reason I bring that up in this particular episode of Guilty Feminist is parenting has taken on a whole different twist in Corona times. And I think a lot of parents have missed having other parents to talk to and just hanging out with other parents. You know, which you don't know, you really realize, because usually you're at the school gates, you think, God, these people are so fucking annoying. Why do I have to talk to them? Then there's Corona. You're like, I miss them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not quoting for any of the moms who are listening to this who know me from the school gates. I'm not talking about you. It was just a hypothetical. Um, <laughs> so but I think Child Labor Podcast, uh, the Child Labor Podcast has been very good to bring people back into the world of parenting and also to hear about how that's affected them in different ways. So yes, if you get a chance, yeah. please go and listen to that. If you're Otherwise, missing comparing I, notes with other parents and just sort of going, yeah. And also smart. it will make you feel very good as a parent. Let me reassure you. <laughs> By comparison, because, when you confess, yeah, it's like right, the guilty because, parent, this, uh, this, this well, podcast, think, isn't it? I think all parenting has these huge swathes of guilt and you forget that. And you think, oh, so-and-so's kid must be at home doing their online schooling really well. And then you find out when you go to the podcast is that most parents are just like, holy shit, this is difficult and I'm a failure. And then we talk about that and then we decide that you're not a failure, at least not worse than your parents were, and that everyone is happy at the end of the podcast, okay? So please go listen to that after you've listened to this. And um, a big thank you to Deborah Francis White for not just having me on this podcast, but just for having this podcast. Thank you, darling. I miss you. Uh, Starling, what are you going to sing for us today? Yeah, it's my first single off the debut album, which is out next year. <laughs> this song was out literally two weeks ago. It's called No Leader. And I kind of had maxed out on the amount of life advice I had asked for and received. So I wrote a song called No Leader, which is like, I'm going to be the leader of my own life. 
<laughs> uh, quite literally. Uh, so that, that's what I'm about to sing. Yeah, no Great. leader. Great. Thank you, Starling. Yeah. Take it away. Beautiful. Take my head out the clouds I took a trip and off the trees If I could plant a pony To get away from the crowd Oh, oh You're only living today I'm not a ticket You don't need to try and validate me Oh, oh I've got a new perspective Don't try to blur my vision I am my own decision That was incredible. Thank you so much. Everyone go and check out Starling. That's definitely going to be playing loudly on speakers in my flat in the morning when I'm feeling like I've got no lead about myself. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Cindy V, and our very special guests, Jamila Risby, Colleen Hickman, Val Riley, and Donatella Rivera, with music from Starling. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge and produced by Nick Sheldon. The producer was Tom Salisky from the Spotted Age Shop. Thanks to Rachel Craft, Magina, DCO, and everyone who made this episode happen, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. I was I was there riding my Peloton going I'm there I'm, I'm what is it I'm not gonna um what, what's the lyrics I don't How can know, I them. Not know I'm not gonna Starling do you what? know them I don't I'm not know gonna what? Hamilton lyrics no not no, give it away my shot okay yeah, you have to edit this in because I I can't even believe I've listened to Hamilton three million times again oh, so yeah. I'm there on the Peloton bike going I'm not giving away my shot a huge thank you to all of our amazing patrons sponsoring us at the Smash the Patriarchy level or above, John Quilcoy and Sarah Boom.